Hello, hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the food. Isn't this food amazing? How about we all give a round of applause to the people at McDaniel that made this great meal for us? This is awesome. All right, for those who don't know me, I'm Mike McMullen. I'm president of the Carroll County Chamber. We're happy to be here. Thank you to our friends at McDaniel for making this great place open for us. We're going to start with something a little different at this meeting. It's like when you go out to the movies, you know, when you're waiting for the main movie, they run some little kind of like teasers of what's coming up next. So we're going to, we're going to uh, open your eyes to something. How many people have ever heard of an event called Ignite? Let me see by your hands. Oh, well, one person is extremely vocal. So we're here to try to make it so you all understand about Ignite. And uh, in order to do that, we're going to, uh, I'm going to have Mr. Chris Abel, who's the Executive Director of Carroll Technology and Innovation Council, come up and introduce Ignite and our speaker for you. So give him your attention, and when the speaker starts, please watch. After he's done, there's going to be about a five-minute break to rearrange the front where you can go and get some more food and do whatever you need to. So how about a round of applause for Chris? Chris Abel. Thank you, Mike. First, I want to thank Mike for generously giving us some time here at this event. Uh, Ignite is a high energy evening of five minute talks by people who have a burning idea and the guts to get on stage and talk about it. One of those people is Mike Sheila from Advantage, Advantage Industries, uh, and he's here to talk about cybersecurity. Mike, come on up. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. It's been a while. I do love karaoke. Yeah, sure. If you've never been to an Ignite event, it's 20 slides in five minutes. They automatically advance. So I've got to know what I'm talking about, and I've got to speak quickly, and I've got to keep pace with the slides. Or else it's comical for all the wrong reasons. Or you may end up just doing it without the slides at all. Yep. Okay, everybody, my name is Mike Shield. I'm Director of Marketing Business Development with Advantage Industries, and I'm going to teach you today how to stop being cyber stupid. And I'm going to say it again for emphasis, stop being cyber stupid. Now, you're probably wondering, what do I mean by cyber stupid? Unfortunately, over 80% of businesses today have never had an independent third-party audit of their technology. So you think about their firewalls, their routers, their computers, their laptops. They've never had somebody else look at it and tell them that they're doing it right, which means that their strategy for the most part has been to stick their head in the sand and hope for the best. Now, these are the businesses that you are working with today. Uh, by the way, I Googled an image of having your head up your ass. Uh, don't ever do that. That's why I chose the head in the sand instead. But this is their strategy. And it's not a good strategy. It is not a safe strategy. It is not a viable strategy. Um, it's bad, okay? Don't do it. Take the time to go out and make some real changes. And it's not just businesses. It's us as individuals as well. So for example, the next time you are at a store and they say, oh, the chip reader's broken, just swipe your credit card. I want you to run. Run far away, get away from that. That is dangerous, that is putting your data at risk, and that is irresponsible of the retailer to do that. Now, imagine this, you're at the doctor's office, you're sitting in the waiting room for 10, 15 minutes, there's that computer in the corner, has all your data up. Do you know how easy it is to plug a thumb drive into that computer and take as much data as you want without them ever even knowing? So, you're thinking, Mike, I'm not a cybersecurity geek, what am I going to do? I can't fix this myself. Well, I have good news for you. I am here to help. So while the next image looks like me as Superman, I was thinking more of Mighty Mouse with, here I come to save the day. You may remember that. Some of you are going, what's Mighty Mouse? OK, uh, Google it. Uh, you'll get a good laugh out of what Mighty Mouse is. But I'm going to give you some low cost, no cost tips that each of you can use. And the last couple of them are specifically for businesses to implement. But these are simple little things that every person can do 
that will either not cost you any money or cost you a little bit of time to implement the program. So the first one that comes up is multi-factor authentication. Now, you bankers out there, you know about this one. We've been MFAing our bank accounts for a long time. Do that everywhere. Do it for your email. Do it for your laptop. Do it. For, how many of you can look at your phone without actually multi-factoring? It's scanning your face to make sure that you're you. And if it doesn't know that, then you have to have a passcode. Use it on your software. That's the biggest place that people miss. Well, my data's in the cloud. It's protected. Mm. Use multi-factor authentication. It will make you much safer for everything that you do. Encrypt your hard drive. This is really not hard. You go to the bottom left-hand corner of your Windows computer or your Mac, and you go into settings, and you say encrypt. So here's why that's useful. If I steal your computer out of your car and you aren't encrypted, I can pop the hard drive out and read it just like I want. Now, stop putting your passwords in your browser. Who thought saving passwords in Google was a bad idea? It is a bad idea, whether you use Firefox or Microsoft has a couple browsers too. And update the operating system. You've all gotten that alert on your phone, right? You need to update. Your computers need to do that too. Your tablets need to do that too. Now, there comes a point where they don't do it anymore. And unfortunately, that's time to spend some money. Throw that sucker in the trash, pull the hard drive out, and get a new device, whether that's a telephone, a laptop, a PC, whatever devices you are using. So once you throw away the bad stuff, make sure it has antivirus, any malware on it. Most infuriating thing, if you go to an Apple bar today and have a problem with your Mac device, they'll tell you, oh, you don't need to run antivirus on there. We're safe. That's a lie. Do not believe them. It is not safe. You can get free antivirus on your computer. Now, for you business owners, get a firewall. It's not terribly expensive. For a small business, you might spend five, $600, and it will go a long way to protecting your business. So make the investment and get a firewall. And the last point that I will bring up today is cyber insurance. Uh, ben Yingling's in the room. He can talk to you about cyber insurance, one of the smartest things that you can do to protect your business. But you're going to have to talk to me because the policy that you get is going to have a bunch of requirements on it. So you want to make sure that they are in sync with each other. Thank you all so much. Uh, click with me on the socials, at Mike Sheila. Thank you so much. Okay, pay no attention to these men behind the screen. They're going to rearrange the front of the office here. So this, I've got the office of the room. So this is like being at the movies, right? Now's the time where you can go and get your Coca-Cola and your popcorn and your desserts. You've got a couple of minutes here before we start the actual program. But while we do that, you guys can go get some more food if you want. But I'm going to do a couple of the announcements I was going to do at the end to help to make up some time. So we are currently... Um, getting folks signed up for our Leadership Carol class of 2023. How many people, by a show of hands, have ever been through Leadership Carol? It's a great program. How many people have not turned off the ringers of their phone? Thank you, Steve Aquino. Yeah, we should really probably turn off the ringers at this point. But uh, we've got like six spaces left. We'll take 43 in the class. Uh, it's going to be filled up by next week. So if you have not signed up for Leadership Carol yet, and if you think you'd like to, please, please do. Also, we're doing something called the Carol Biz Challenge. It's an amazing program that we've been doing for the past 10 years. This year marks number 11, where local entrepreneurs will submit an idea for a business. They've either just started it or they want to. And we have a committee that picks the top five who then pitch at a live event that we do on uh, August 18th at the Carroll Arts Center. And the grand prize this year will probably be 10 grand. Um, and it's, it's, it's great to get involved. So it's the Carroll Biz Challenge. Go to carolbizchallenge.com or go to our website and you can fill out the application. It's free. We're going to Greece in October of this, this year. Great trip, amazing trip. A very educational trip. I'd say if there's any students in here, you need to uh, you know, get your parents to fund you guys a trip to Greece. Uh, I, have them call me. I'll tell them how important it is and how the college here said they'd give you extra credit. Uh, I think, right, they'd give you like six hours of whatever credit and whatever facet you want if you take the trip. So Dr. Jaskin isn't looking at me at all because she's not listening. So, All right, so are we ready, guys?
Nope, we're almost ready. Okay, we're gonna start now. Thank you once again. I want to start by thanking our friends from CMC. Can I have your attention, please? We're actually being filmed and streamed right now from our friends from CMC. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I didn't know that my hellos can get that much applause. Thanks again. My name is Mike McMullen. I'm president of the Carroll County Chamber. And uh, again, I want to thank CMC for filming this event for us. They're also streaming this event. Uh, they help us with so many, so many events. And at this point, I want to introduce to you uh, basically your MC of the day, who happens to be the chair of our board, the Ting Girl, Miss Valerie Giovignoni. Give her a round of applause. Between a title that doesn't matter to anyone in this room and an Italian name that no one can say, it's, it's fun to be introduced. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, I'm Valerie with Ting, and I am delighted to both serve as the chamber chair this year and your MC for the day. Um, of course, in true Mike McMullen fashion, we must begin with asking you all to what? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> All right. The Legislative Committee of the Chamber has a long tradition of reviewing proposed legislation and taking a pro-business stand by writing letters to our delegation in Annapolis. If you would like to participate in this critically important Chamber Committee, please see Mike McMullen. The Legislative Committee will start meeting in mid-January 2023 and run through the end of March. If you are a member of our Legislative Committee, please stand and be recognized. Thank you to Chris and Andrea and Dana for being here today. Um, as I recognize elected and appointed officials, I would ask that you please stand when your name is called. We have members of our Carroll delegation here, Senator Justin Reedy, <laughs> Delegate Haven Shoemaker, and Delegate April Rose. In addition, from Baltimore County, we have Senator Chris West. With us today, we also have some members of the Board of Education of Carroll County Public Schools. We have with us Board Vice President, Marsha Herbert. <laughs> Board Member, Tyra Battaglia. <laughs> and Board Member, Patricia Dorsey. I'd also like to recognize the president of McDaniel College and a member of our chamber board, Dr. Julia Jaskin. We also have some past chairs of the chamber's board of directors. With us, we have immediate past chair, Steve Aquino of Aquino Financial Group. We have Wayne Barnes of R. Wayne Barnes Life and Long-Term Care. We have Steve Lance from Carroll Community College. Mr. Dave Bollinger of Barnes Bollinger Insurance. And Ben Yingling of Crawford Yingling Insurance. If you are currently on the Chamber's Board of Directors, please stand to be recognized. Thank you for all that you do for the Chamber and for the business community of Carroll County to each of you who we have recognized today. So now we're going to talk about our sponsors. Um, it's time to hear from our first sponsor, New Windsor, or uh, mm, Old Habits Die Hard, sorry, NWSB Bank. Do you say NWSB Bank, even though there's two Bs? Okay, NWSB Bank. Um, and we'll hear from Tim Utz, Community Banking Manager for the College Square office in Westminster, and Kelly Vita, Mortgage Producing Sales Manager and Mortgage Loan Originator for Carroll and Frederick Counties. Tim and Kelly. Well, 
I'm Tim Hutz. I'm the community banking manager at the College Square location, which is right by Safeway. Uh, Lenny knows where it is if you need someone to tell you. <laughs> but uh, we are a local community bank. Um, we are a division of ACMB Bank, which is a community bank in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, our number one goal is, community, is community, being out in the community and customer service. That's our top goals. Um, you know, we have five branches in the Carroll County region, and we're here to serve you and anything you need. Come find us at uh, College Square, and we'd be more than happy to help you. I'll introduce Kelly, our new mortgage rep. Hi. Hi, thank you, Tim. Hi, I'm Kelly Vita. I am the producing sales manager for the residential mortgage division at NWSB Bank. Um, it's a friendly reminder that we do mortgages as well as many of you know we have an amazing commercial loan department. Uh, so we do uh, offer mortgages for construction, lot loans, refinances, purchases, all that good stuff. So if you have any questions, concerns, um, or clients that would be open to speak to me about a mortgage, I would be happy to help them. And I'm glad that everybody is here and we're happy to be sponsors. So um, thank you for your time. That's all. Thank you, Tim and Kelly. Thank you to our media sponsor who is streaming this event today, of course, the CMC. And here to speak for them is Richard Turner, our executive director of the CMC and member of the Carroll County Chamber Board. Thanks very much, Val. Uh, thanks to everyone who's here, our elected officials. And uh, this is a great opportunity to hear from them about what's been happening certainly out in Annapolis. Um, some of you know us uh, from the various events that we've been at. I hope you've been watching our programming as well that you'll find on cable, on uh, HD 1086, as well as on cables, cable channels 19 and 23. Uh, but also find us on the web, uh, through our website, carolmediacenter.org, where you'll find a lot of content available through our YouTube and Facebook and other streams, uh, a lot of the local events that are going on. But as you know, uh, while we're talking about what uh, a wrap-up for the legislative session, we're just entering into the new election season. So you're going to hear a lot from uh, various folks who are running for office. There are certainly a number of offices that are open. And as a nonprofit organization, we are dedicated to voter education and civic, civic engagement. So as part of that, we are having an opportunity for every candidate to come in. We provide them with a level playing field so that they can give their statement about why they're running for office. You can hear directly from the candidates. Uh, we'll also be at various forums for uh, the various offices that are, uh, where there are contested races. So you'll have an opportunity to submit questions as well to those candidates. And we really encourage you to take advantage of that electronic voter guide that we will have on our website so that you can learn more about the candidates and encourage you, uh, your neighbors and your friends to become informed and educated voters. Uh, take advantage of that site at our, on our website. So with that, thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. I will say that the, the videos uh, for the candidates are where I go to for, for voter education, and it's nice to have some consistency and some true um, support of our community. So thank you for all that you do. Okay, uh, now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the president of McDaniel College and today's main sponsor and host, President Dr. Julia Jaskin. So much it's it's wonderful to be with you all today and I know we're all very much looking forward to to uh, hearing about the uh, recent legislative session uh, from the the Carroll delegation so um, we always very much appreciate the support and advocacy uh, of the delegation on behalf of McDaniel um, and uh, particularly related to our capital project so um, very much appreciate that so this may be the first time that a lot of you are in the newly renovated uh, uh, Raj Student Center. Um, can you just raise your hand if this is your first time that you've been here since sort of pre-COVID times? 
Yeah, so um, I hope that you get an opportunity uh, after after lunch uh, to head upstairs and just take a look around. Um, we've uh, made a lot of investments, uh, and this is really the nerve center of the college, so I'm excited for you to get an opportunity to, to see uh, what's happening up there. We have our Center for Experience and Opportunity, uh, which is um, our really our one-stop shop for experiential learning, and um, that has a lot to do with community engagement, internships, um, if you have campus or if you have employment opportunities uh, that you're interested in, that's really uh, the, the place to, to go there. Um, uh, we also have Erin Benevento, which I know uh, many of you have met, our Associate Dean for Student Development, and she's been leading a lot of our city partnerships, and um, I know that she's met with some of you as we've uh, begun moving forward with our strategic planning process. Lots of um, exciting things happening with the city and connections there. And I just wanted to read a couple of those uh, from you. So um, we're gonna be uh, improving communication between McDaniel and our community partners through reimagining the McDaniel and Main Committee. I know some of you have been involved with that. Um, we are focused on using technology to uh, promote consistent channels of communication to constituents outside of McDaniel, increasing McDaniel's presence at community events, uh, encouraging parents and alumni to visit downtown, uh, when, uh, downtown businesses and businesses in the region when they're here, um, and uh, collaborating with nonprofit groups, uh, working with DEIJ initiatives in town. So lots of, of really wonderful things on the horizon. Um, and I just want to um, thank you all, uh, the businesses of Carroll County. Um, you really play a powerful role in the support and education of our students. We're thankful for uh, that partnership. And um, I am a, a proud uh, member of the chamber. You see I have the badge. Um, and I, and I, I love this, I, I really do. Um, I have two of these, I like it so much. Um, so um, looking forward to, to uh, continuing to strengthen those partnerships. And then the last little plug, I don't know, did you all park out here sort of or over there, okay. Well, so if you did park out here and you haven't had a chance to see the water tower, um, it's a beautiful thing. And it's got our logo on it. It says uh, McDaniel College. And um, that is something that we were able to do uh, connected to the city and really appreciated their partnership uh, with that as well. And it's a, a testament to our, our pride um, and, and uh, connection with the city. So um, I wondered just very quickly if I could, um, I know there are a lot of you who are either current students or WMC or McDaniel grads. I wondered if I could have you stand up if you're in either of those categories and we can just say uh, thank you to all of you. And then two other people I wanted to introduce you to, um, and I know uh, you've, some of you have met them already, but they're new to our community. Uh, Dave Sears is our new VP for Institutional Advancement, if you could stand up. And... Um, and we are so, so glad that Dave has uh, joined us uh, maybe just a couple months now, three months, something like that. And then um, Carolyn Salazar is also someone I wanted to introduce you to if you haven't met her already. Um, she's in charge of our Carroll County Student Grant Program that I know many of you have been involved with uh, over time. That is a grant program that we are uh, very appreciative of, and um, it's it's going to be a focus for us this coming year. Uh, if you're not familiar with that program, that uh, gives $2,000 uh, uh, scholarships to students in Carroll County to come to McDaniel, and um, so we're really looking forward to um, continuing to, to increase those scholarships and, and partner with all of you. So thank you so much, and uh, do I turn things back over to Val? Okay. Dr. Jaskin, I can say I believe I was coming through the light by McDonald's down 140, and you can see the logo from the water tower that far away. It's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> All right, so thank you for your words. Um, and now let's get this party started, right? Um, we, um, if our delegation can come forward, um, we are going to have um, Dana Bloom, the chair of the Chamber's Legislation Committee, kick things off.
afternoon. Good to see everybody. Um, we're going to be on a pretty tight schedule. <coughs> Excuse me for the rest of the um, <coughs> for the rest of the show. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, the pollen is really doing a job on me this week. But um, <coughs> we have two of our delegation that need to leave early, so we're going to kind of switch it up and. Uh, give them an opportunity, and then we'll try to see if we have some time for questions. So <clears throat> when we start, if you could give us a, a quick synopsis of uh, who you are, your district, and the top issue that you dealt with this year, that would be great. And I believe we're going to start with Senator Reedy. You can, or there. Wherever you want. <clears throat> Thank you, I have some. I'm going to drown. <laughs> Thank you. I'm one of those people that has to slip out early, so it makes it less awkward if I'm already up here when I slip over. I have to apologize. I got, as Mike won't let me say, I got double booked. I double booked myself to speak to another great business group in Carroll County, so I'm going to go speak to them too at the same time uh, and scold them for not being here. But, uh, uh, <laughs> Good, good afternoon. It's so good to see all of you. We, we love coming back to Carroll County from our legislative session. We see more friendly faces uh, from our perspective a lot of times. Uh, and this year I, is it such a critically important year as we face an election year uh, as well. Um, and uh, we have redistricting that's taken place. So there's a lot of change happening in Carroll County and around the state. Uh, but uh, the legislative session really, um, there were positives and negatives. Uh, the previous legislative session in 2021 I was a pretty bad one, not going to lie. Uh, this one, there were, there were some positive steps forward in some areas, but particularly as it relates to the business community and, and sort of our economic climate and tax structure in the state, which I know is of importance to a lot of folks in this room, uh, it's one of those one step forward, maybe one and a half steps back kind of situation. So the positives we had this session were that we – through some very sound fiscal management and candidly also through a lot of federal government largesse handing out our tax dollars, uh, we, we had a very good budget situation. So we ended up with a very large surplus in the state. Um, but we would have had that surplus even without the federal ARPA money and the federal money that came down, which I think is a testament to, to the last eight years under Governor Hogan um, on the fiscal side. And many of us really advocating and fighting and continue to try to keep a handle on excessive government spending. Um, and because of that, there was a large enough surplus where even our Democratic colleagues, many of whom never want to ever cut taxes because they view that as giving money that belongs to the government back to you, which is not how we view it, we actually were able to secure some tax relief on for seniors over the age of 65 on retirement tax income. Did not go as far as I would have liked, as any of us would have liked. But it is uh, $300 million annual tax relief for seniors um, to against, um, it's going to be about, a th it's going to work out if you make under $100,000 a year in retirement income as an individual, it's going to work out to being about $1,000 off of the taxes that you owe to the state. Uh, I believe we should gradually phase out retirement taxes in general in the state, but this is a step forward in the right direction. We also had several things like adding more exemptions to the sales tax for items that help working families and help seniors, some medical items, things like diapers also that, that for kids and for, 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 for young families. So there were some positives in that regard. And we ended again still with a very solid budget surplus with money in rainy day funds to make sure we're hedging against the future. I think had we not done that, there could have been a temptation to take the money that we received from the federal government and create new programs. Generally speaking, that did not happen. I say generally, I'm, there were probably a few things that did happen that we would have preferred not to, but there w the investments we were able to, because they were gonna spend the federal money on one-time projects, we also were able to bring back a lot of help for Carroll County. I'm someone who, and I'll stand before you every time we're here and say, I think we need to spend less money and the government is too big and spends too much money. However, when there were funds available, I wanna be sure that there were worthy projects that we had in the county that we were able to take care of that. And so, for example, McDaniel, we were able to uh, meet, be able to get some funding to meet a need that McDaniel had. Several of our towns, we were able to bring back one-time money to help address water sewer issues, other types of things that normally you can't address in a lump sum kind of way. 
and we were able to help a lot of community organizations as well. So all that was positive. The negative um, of that, that, however, one of the negatives, uh, particularly as it relates to the business community, is the issue of paid sick leave, uh, setting up, not, uh, of, of paid time off, not paid sick leave, but paid time off, setting up an entire program and structure for a government-run system that will institute a payroll tax on every worker in the state of Maryland, paid for, and this paid time off fund, administered by a, by a state government program with state employees, will be paid for partially by employees and partially by employers. Um, Delegate Rose is gonna get into more of the details of that. It is a huge mess, and the reason it's a huge mess is, even if you wanted to do this kind of program and run it through state government, which my argument would be, I'm very sympathetic to want to find a way to get more paid leave and paid time off for people, but there are a lot of private sector solutions that could perhaps be worked with, maybe some sort of hybrid system set up with the government if you're going to do this. Uh, they didn't do any of that. And, and instead, they put together sort of a hodgepodge program uh, the one house wanted to delay it for two years and study it and do actuary studies. One house wanted to pass something to get it started right away but not start having people pay into it right away and have several guardrails though on how much could be taken out of people's paychecks. They sort of passed the worst of both in one big package. So I think Delegate Rose will touch on the details a little bit more. I, I just had a discussion. Our Senate President has even acknowledged that we're going to have to come back to the table and make a lot of fixes to something that we just passed which the governor vetoed and we supported his veto, but it was overridden because, you know, it's hard to say no when you tell people, hey, you can get paid time off. Well, it you know, nobody knows that it's gonna be a payroll tax on you every week of your paycheck. You're gonna have to pay into this, into this fund and you don't have a choice. Uh, so that, that was the negative from the business community side. I think it's gonna make it much more difficult for our job creators and I don't think people realize, people that might even hear about it would realize that it's something that's gonna be coming out of their paycheck like another FICA every week. And it doesn't matter whether you work for the smallest employer or the largest. Now there were some exemptions put in the bill for smaller employers to not necessarily have to participate in it, but the employees will still have to pay for it. So that's the negative. So we had the positive of tax relief and of, of some steps forward and a, and, and a pretty good budget situation but we had the negative of setting up this very expensive program. Now, it's not gonna start tomorrow. They made sure that they'll start taking the money out of the paychecks, by the way, after the election, I thought it was interesting. Um, but, and there is some time where we can continue to battle to try to make it so it's not so destructive. But that's the frustration we have, is so that everybody recognizes, even the, Demo even the most liberal Democrats acknowledge our economy has some problems, businesses are struggling to find workers, but yet they go and make things more difficult. Um, so. That's always the challenge we fight in Annapolis. I'm sorry that I cannot stay around because of my irresponsibility double booking myself, Mike. Thank you. Um, I did. I am excited that um, Senator West is here because redistricting has changed Carroll County's legislative map. I sent an email out about this today, actually. And so there will be a, a, a district coming into the eastern part of the county, and Senator West is the current senator for that district. So you definitely would like to, I want to be sure you get to know him and Senator West, and we've worked well together on a whole lot of issues, business issues particularly, so I'm um, glad that he could be here. Um, I really appreciate the chamber, all the input you've given us uh, this year was very helpful. We worked, we were able to get some things done in the finance committee that I sit on because of your input, and please continue to do that. Um, please also feel free to reach out to me anytime that I can be helpful, and I look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you very much. Senator, um, Delegate Shoemaker. She almost demoted me to senator. How about uh, <laughs> so it's uh, it's great to be with you all. It's great to be back home. Uh, I guess this will be the last time that uh, I address you as uh, a member of the House of Delegates. I thought that that would get a lot of applause. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, as, as uh, Senator Reedy alluded to, well, for one thing, you know, let me, uh, uh, let me also acknowledge Senator West, who, because of redistricting, it will now be my senator over in Hampstead. So th glad to have you here, Senator. He's a good guy. Uh, this past session was pretty brutal, to be perfectly frank. 
Uh, and I would agree with uh, uh, Justin that it was certainly not as brutal as 2021 with all the uh, police reform nonsense and such that we had to deal with uh, last year. Although I have to tell you, there was still a lot of um, uh, soft on crime criminal coddling that went on in the Maryland General Assembly this year, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, crime is on the rise throughout the state, not just in Baltimore, but throughout the state of Maryland. And I guess they haven't gotten the memo about that. I mean, we couldn't even, uh, we couldn't even get them to agree to felonize the theft of a handgun like the governor's been pushing for for years. And that just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I will say that after years of sitting all the way in the back of the chamber uh, for the first seven years I was down there, uh, this year, you know, the caucus, the Republican caucus selected me the minority whips. So I was the number two fellow down there, and I got a front row seat to the whole train wreck, and I got to watch it unfold. So. <laughs> And I guess uh, uh, the reason that I would suggest it wasn't uh, uh, a complete disaster is just what uh, Justin alluded to. It's because we were able to secure at least a modicum of tax relief for folks. We got, uh, uh, we got the uh, sales tax exempted from you know, baby bottles and diapers and diabetic supplies, which, you know, as a diabetic, I certainly appreciate. There was the $1,000 tax credit uh, on retirement income that he talked about uh, briefly for folks over the age of 65. We're still not competitive uh, with surrounding states, which I suspect is why we've been losing uh, retirees in droves. Altogether, it was about uh, $400 million worth of tax relief, and that's not particularly great when you consider that we went into the session with a $7.5 billion, that's billion with a B, surplus. So essentially, we got crumbs. That's more or less what we got. But, you know, we were able uh, to bring about 85, 86 million dollars in uh, uh, capital money uh, back home with us uh, for projects here in Carroll County at, you know, at the municipal level and, and uh, other worthwhile projects for Carroll County. So we did, we did very well in that regard. But what they did do down there this year, uh, you know, that, that was the good stuff that I alluded to. So the the downside is that they spent uh, the overwhelming bulk of their time and energy uh, doing stuff essentially to uh, galvanize their base and get them to the polls in November because obviously it's an election year this year. And, you know, what they did things, you know, they did a lot of the social justice stuff, um, uh, including, um, you know, a, a abortion expansion and recreational marijuana and, and for good measure or bad measure from my perspective, you know, there was pretty radical climate change legislation that passed and the Family Medical Leave Act uh, legislation that uh, Delegate uh, Rose is going to allude to. So. It was a very uh, mixed bag, uh, a lot more bad than good, but it was a heck of a lot better overall uh, than the year before. So I do take solace in that fact. It's been an honor and a privilege for me to uh, represent Carroll County and the Maryland House of Delegates uh, for the last eight years. It, it, the time flew by. Yeah, of course, it goes by pretty quick the older you get, they say. So it flew by, but here it is. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll be able to address you in some other
capacity at some point. Uh, should I uh, be fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to uh, attain this other office that I'm seeking right now? So thank you all very much. Always great to be with you, and God bless. And I have to go to court. So. <laughs> Absolutely, Delegate Rose, would you like to come up here? Thank you, and uh, I'm gonna truly miss my, um, my colleague and also our colleague, Delegate Krebs, who is luckily in Disney World right now, but I've had the pleasure of serving with, I think, just the best delegation um, in, in Annapolis, uh, and we're very happy to have some new folks worked with Chris as well. So, uh, but again, just to echo what uh, Justin and Haven said, it is always wonderful to get home. It was a particularly, I would say, kind of brutal <coughs> session. You certainly knew that it was an election year with the agendas. Um, I serve on Ways and Means, and um, I found it, I'll say funny, but not really funny, haha, -ha, that all of a sudden all of our colleagues that said no to all of our tax credit bills for the last eight years, you, everybody wanted a tax credit bill from anything, I think I'm gonna say the silliest one was for sewing supplies. And you know, it's like, okay, um, but you know, all the meaningful tax bills that we had put in before were always a no, and now every, everybody wanted, it was like the Oprah show, you get a tax credit, you get a tax credit. We didn't get very much, but that's, we're used to that. Um, so I guess I will just jump straight to, um, the paid family leave to me was one of the most egregious uh, bills and arguments that we had on the House floor. Um, it, it will provide 12 weeks of paid leave, not 100% salary, but I'll tell you this, I will try to answer questions and I'll tell you what we do know. I think the most appalling part of this entire bill is they don't know exactly how they're going to do this, what it's going to cost, what it's going to cost the employer or the employee. They estimate that the cost is going to be about 1.6 billion, again with a B, cost to the state. But the big questions when you're passing such a big policy, they didn't have the answers to. And the floor leader, um, uh, delegate was getting quite annoyed with me because I speak from an employer standpoint and I work in HR, um, mostly with recruiting, thank goodness, but I understand the implementation of these things and somebody has got to stand up for the business community at, who are ha going to have to implement these, these uh, sort of pie in the sky sometimes, well-intentioned but very expensive programs. And so the payroll tax breakdown, they don't know how much it's gonna cost the employer, the employee. We did get him after sort of badgering a little bit that, well, some of the estimates are about $21 per pay. Well, $21 per pay, you know, is a lot to a lot of people. And so while it sounds great that we're gonna give this leave, when you look at the small companies, that was the other part I thought was particularly horrible, is it's companies of under 15. One, five, 15. Normally they start this stuff, they start messing with you at about 50 employees. This one was for some of the smallest businesses. And I had business owners, you know, texting me and telling me, in particular one jumps to my mind, a landscaping company, and this is their busy season. So if they have, and there's no really limitation to it. So if you have 15 employees, four of them want this leave, and you're at your busiest time of the year, what are you going to do? How are you going to handle this? And they, the answer constantly was, well, it's always the right time to do the right thing. And that sounds great as a soundbite, but in the practicality of implementing this, there's just no understanding of the, just the impact that this could have. So they're gonna study it, they're past it, now they're gonna study it, they're gonna figure out how they're going to implement it. And my question on the floor too was, okay, so isn't that the equivalent of, you know, you're gonna build the airplane while you're careening down the runway? Is this the way we should be doing public policy? And again, it's, it's always the right time to do the right thing. So um, they are going to be working on studying this and implementing it. It's not immediate. We'll certainly keep you informed as to what the dates will be. I was encouraged to hear Justin say that they're gonna revisit some of this next year. Often, you know, I don't know how, what Chris will say, but 
the House sometimes is like the Wild West, and then we, we rely on the Senate to sort of calm things down even just a little bit. So um, hopefully we can revisit some of this and make it maybe less egregious. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. It'll be after the election, so maybe people will be a little bit more reasonable. Um, the other part that, I, that concerned me is um, the Department of Labor will be implementing this because I asked, okay, how are you going to confirm that somebody has somebody out, you need to be on this leave to care for a family member? And the list of family members is very long, so it could be like a second cousin and you know things like that. They may change it, and I don't know if you actually whittled that list down, but um, it was pretty, pretty long. And they were like, well, we're going to have them submit paperwork to the Department of Labor. Okay, well, how are you going to do this? Well, we're going to put together, you know, an online system. And I said, oh, it brought to you by the same people that brilliantly handled uh, unemployment over the past couple of years. So that didn't uh, really particularly <laughs> fill, my, fill my heart with joy. Um, so that's kind of one of the, I guess, one of the worst things. That's, that's the general, again, I can't tell you exactly because they don't know either. So hopefully we can maybe raise the employer threshold and maybe change some things moving forward. Um, you know, uh, they already mentioned some of the retirement tax cuts. We've had so many t retirement tax cuts and discussions over the years, and it's always no. I am very thankful for what we were able to get, but again, it's really not enough. With such a large surplus, we really had the opportunity this year to do meaningful tax cuts to the citizens of Maryland, and we squandered that opportunity. So I'm very disappointed in that. In particular, when they're going to implement this paid leave, they certainly could have done some sort of a business tax credit or reduction to sort of offset some of the costs. So if they really wanted to do that, but also not impact the business community, they had the opportunity to do that, and they did not do so. Um, some other, uh, I guess, I, I don't want to take too much time because I know we like to do questions and answers. Um, the gentleman that talked about cyber, um, he was singing my song, and um, that's something I've put in bills about computer education, um, and cybersecurity is extremely important, and I had a tax credit bill in for that, for just what he was speaking about, a one-time assessment for a small business to find out where are your vulnerabilities, what do you need, help them to purchase that, incentivize them to purchase it. I also put in that they would get a small credit moving forward for the implementation, because once you do the um, assessment and then you bring in the equipment, you still have to do sort of annual updates at least to make sure that uh, you're keeping everything up to date. But I didn't, Oprah didn't give me that tax credit, so uh, hopefully we're, I'm gonna put it in again and uh, we'll see if we can possibly get something um, to help the small business community for that moving forward. With that, I will, I will wrap up. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Um, we love being home. I'm so happy that we're here in person once again to see everybody's happy faces. So thank you so much, and I, I am not running off. I will be here. <laughs> thank you. And lastly, we will hear from Senator West, who is going to be taking over um, a portion of Carroll County, yeah. representing, so. Thank you. So I'm a total stranger. I'm not sure anybody here knows me. <laughs> I'm not sure I know anybody, knew anybody except to the elected representatives when I arrived. So let me tell you a little bit of myself, about myself. Uh, I was born in 1950. I grew up in the 1950s in a nuclear family. Dad worked at Black & Decker. Mom taught school at Bryn Mawr School. Uh, my younger brother and I um, grew up with a wonderful uh, set of parents. On Tuesday nights, we would sit on the floor, the, the two of us, and Mom and Dad were the chairs. We'd all watch Leave it to Beaver together. So that's the kind of family we were. It was a different world, let me tell you, than it is now. I went to Gilman School, went on to Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Uh, Williams, Amherst, and Wesleyan are called the Little Three. I went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I started to practice law, passed the bar exam in 1975. I practiced for nearly 40 years before in 2014, an opportunity came to run for public office. I had never run before, 2014. I was, I'm a past president of the Bar Association of Baltimore City. I served two terms on the Board of Governors of the Maryland State Bar Association, so I had a really good legal career. 
But at the age of 64, which I was then, I thought, you know, maybe there's something other than practicing law that I should consider for the rest of my active life. And I, so I decided to do something totally disruptive, and I ran for the House of Delegates. And I won. I spent the whole year knocking on doors, which is how you get elected if you're running for the House of Delegates. Um, and so for four years, uh, I was in the House of Delegates uh, with April. Um, and then the last four years, my, my state senator decided to run for Baltimore County Executive. And never let anybody tell you my vote doesn't count. He lost the Democratic primary, which was the deciding election in 2018 by 17 votes. 17 votes in all of Baltimore County. Um, that's why we have Johnny Olszewski as our county executive not, and not Jim Brochin. But he left his seat open and so I literally went hat in hand to everybody who I thought would be, make a good state senator and said, why don't you run for the seat? I want to run for House of Delegates again. And everybody turned me down. So it was like a game of musical chairs. And when the music stopped, here I was running for state senator. It turned out to be a very close election. I come from a district which in currently includes Towson, which is extremely democratic. I got less than a third of the votes in Towson. I'm a Republican, by the way. Um, and then northern Baltimore County, I did just well enough to overcome my opponent's lead coming out of Towson. So I won with less than 51% of the vote. So I must have done something right, because this year when they, when they redistricted the districts, they put me in a district. They took Towson out of my district and added it to Baltimore City. And in Towson's place, they gave me Eastern Carroll County. So my district comes from being a really toss-up district to being an overwhelmingly Republican district. Um, so uh, I'm now, I just turned 72. I'm gonna run one more time this year. When I turn 76, I'm not gonna pull a Joe Biden and wanna be in my office so I'm sort of staggering around uh, when I'm uh, 80 years old. Um, so this will be my last term, but I intend to give it my all for the people of Carroll County. Uh, Carroll County gets one and a third state senators. Uh, so you've got Justin Reedy, he's the one, but there has to be another third. You can't put those constituents in Justin's district, it would, it, there'd be too many people. So the, the other third has been in Southern Carroll County for the last decade. You had Gail Bates and now you have Katie Hester. Uh, Katie's leaving Carroll County. She will now be in a um, Howard County, Montgomery County district. But then they had to put all those voters somewhere. So because I represented Northern Baltimore County right up to the Carroll County line, they extended my district into Carroll County, which is why I'm getting a third of the people. So that tells you a little bit about me. Uh, let's, let's talk about a couple of issues. Gerrymandering, we talked about the redistricting. Maryland has been a national laughing stock, literally a laughing stock for the past 10 years because of our ridiculous congressional districts. So this year, the Democrats did exactly the same thing. They went back behind closed doors and they drew lines which were nearly as crazy, not quite, but nearly as crazy as the ones that we've been operating under for the last 10 years. They had one district I loved, it was John Cardin's district, excuse me, John Cardin, it was John Sarbanes' district, um, which extended from the DC line all the way up to the Conowingo Dam, and it looked like Barney the Dinosaur. Uh, if you just look at it on the outline on the map, and Barney's little arms were sticking out trying to grab the TV towers on TV Hill. Um, so. A judge, uh, the ch a challenge was brought, the judge uh, looked at it. She called the district egregious, egregiously gerrymandered, a product of extreme gerrymandering, and she threw it out as being unconstitutional, not under the US Constitution, but under Maryland's Constitution. And my reaction is good for her, because if she hadn't done that, we would continue to have this problem every 10 years. Maryland's a democratic state, as you, I'm sure you all know, and we have 47 state senators, 32 Democrats, 15 Republicans. We don't even have a third of the state senators. It's even worse in the House. There are like 100 Democrats and 41 uh, Republicans. So again, not less than a third. So we, we control nothing. If the Democrats want, and sometimes they do, they simply roll over us and they don't care uh, what we think. Um, so, uh, with the gerrymandering, w once the, the, the judge threw it out, she gave us five days to give her a new plan. And two of those days were weekend days. So, um, so we had to come up quickly with a brand new bill, uh, and actually the new bill is not bad. Uh, it, it's got some problems, I think, but overall it's a darn good bill. But what it does is it gives, it makes four of the districts genuinely competitive. I, I think it's wrong for politicians to run in districts where, there's, where they're easily going to win. Because what that does is let the, lets the extremes of the party control who the, who the elected represent, representative is going to be. Uh, I don't think that's healthy. I would rather have districts which are competitive. 
Uh, so everybody who's elected is always looking over their shoulder to see who's running behind them. And that keeps them on their toes to do the right thing and represent the people effectively. So um, we have four congressional districts now where that's going to be the case. One of them is right here in Carroll County. It's Dutch, Dutch Rupersberger now will represent the people in Carroll County as well as a lot of the people in Baltimore County, many of whom are Republican. Now the district remains on balance Democratic, but this is going to be a very Republican year. And the Republican National Committee woman for the state of Maryland, um, 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 Nickley, Nickley Ambrose, is running against Dutch. She can raise money nationally. It, I think it's going to be a competitive race, and you guys are going to be right in the middle of it because of the challenge to the Democratic map. Uh, so <clears throat> this is really good news, I think. And hopefully, we'll do the same thing 10 years from now. But in the meantime, we'll have three elections. This election, 2026 and 2030, using these maps. Um, so I also was going to talk about the paid family leave. The one thing that uh, April didn't say about that um, was that there's no indication about how much, what percentage of the money the businesses are going to have to pay. According to the bill we passed, it could be anywhere from 25% to 75% of the cost of this program is going to be shouldered by Maryland small businesses. Um, so, and the Secretary of Labor is going to make that decision. So uh, it sort of it depends on who the next governor is. If we get a very liberal Democratic governor with a very liberal Democratic Secretary of Labor, I'll guarantee you that it will be 75%. And then you gotta figure that the, the Democrats are beholden to their base, the extreme left wingers, and before we see each other again in four years, or four years from now, I'll guarantee you that we'll have gone from 75% to 100%. So the employers will be paying 100% of the cost of this program allowing their employees to take up to 12 weeks, three months off, whenever a whole host of things happen. Your grandmother gets sick, you can take three months off. Your first cousin gets sick, you can take three months off. Your brother gets sick, you can take three months off. A parent dies, you can take three months off. You get pregnant. You not only can you take three months off, if you're the woman, your husband can take three months off. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And employers, I believe, are going to find that they never are operating with full workforces. To, to, boot, to boot, you're not allowed to replace the employee. The employee has to be given his job or her job back at the end of the three months. So if it's an indispensable position, you have to find somebody who can do it. Where are you going to find somebody who can just step into the job and can do this job for three months and know the person after three months, you're gonna, the person's going to lose his job because the original person's coming back again? It's just a disaster for employees. So my question is, here's what I believe is going to happen. Once employers realize what's going on, and they're not realizing it now, they won't for a while because the bill's been delayed. Once they realize what's going on, I'll bet employers fall over backwards to try to avoid hiring employees, especially avoid hiring employees, women who are uh, in reproductive age and, and their husbands, because they know perfectly well they're going to lose these people for a quarter of a year at a time in many cases, over and over and over and over again over, as the years go on. So employers are going to try to trim their workforce as much as possible so they won't be subjected to this. Uh, and they're going to try to have older employees who are not of childbearing years. That's my feeling as to what's going to happen long term with this bill. It's a disaster. Um, let me talk about, uh, I'll talk about one more, and that's the crime bills. Uh, we, this was, that was the big deal last year. Again, it was a big deal this year. So we had a, an execution of a police officer in Baltimore City earlier in the year. There was a lady who was sitting in her patrol car late at night in a bad part of town, uh, but she was in the patrol car, patrol car and someone came up and executed her. And they found her dead body in that patrol car. So there was an effort made in the General Assembly to deny parole to people who murder police officers. Now, a couple of years ago, we eliminated the death penalty. And I was in favor of that um, because there are lots of reasons why. Um, um, taking, taking lives is not something which I think is a good idea. But we were, the solace was if we got rid of the death penalty, um, we would still have life without parole. And so the people who committed the most heinous crimes would go to jail and would never get out. Well, what is a more heinous crime than executing a police officer? So our our um, amendment to this bill was to deny parole to people who murdered police officers. Democrats unanimously opposed it, opposed it, and therefore it failed. So 
what is kind of a message does that send to our men and women in blue who are out there every day on the streets protecting us to let them know that if they get executed by someone, we're going to allow that person to apply for parole? I just think it's terrible. So it follows on the bills from last year. Um, now my specialty always has been to work, roll up my sleeves, and to sit down and work arm to arm, shoulder to shoulder, with everybody on my committee, whether it was the HGO committee when I was in the House, or the Judicial Proceedings Committee, now that I'm in the Senate. Um, doesn't matter what party you're a member of, we're going to take bills and we're going to try to make them better. We're going to try to scrub these bills, smooth out their rough edges. We're going to try to take out of the bills things that we can't, the people can't live with, so we end up with consensus bills, or close to consensus bills on the floor. Um, that's, that's my specialty. So last year, we did that with the policing bills. In my committee, judicial proceedings, we took nine policing bills. One couldn't be fixed, but eight could, and we fixed them. And when they ended up out on the floor, many Republicans, including I, voted for, for all, I voted for all eight of them because I thought they'd been fixed well enough that I could support them. Other Republicans voted for some of them. Some Republicans voted with me for all eight of them. We sent them over to the House. What happened in the House? April wasn't responsible. They all got thrown in the wastebasket. The Democrats threw them all in the wastebasket and sent us back bills which were worse than our bills that started out being. For example, they included taking policemen's pensions away from them. If a policeman does something wrong, no other employee in the state do we take their pensions away. We're going to take policemen's pensions away, and the judge had no choice. It was mandatory. The judge had to take the policeman's pension away. By the time we finished with those bills, thank goodness we'd gotten rid of that. That had been stripped out. But the bills ended up being terrible. And look what's happened as a result. We have the record vacancies in our police departments across the state. Senior policemen, the ones who are eligible, take early retirement. Mid-career policemen resign in order to take jobs in the private sector. It's very hard to find qualified young people to apply to become policemen. And as a result, we have record vacancies in all of our police departments. And crime is out of control. Baltimore City, we had 317 murders last year. Baltimore County, we had a record murder rate last year. Violent crime is shooting up. What we are doing is just wrong. So your Republicans down there are doing our level best to try to pass reasonable, common sense legislation. And we're being defeated not by the, the traditional Democrats, but by the, these progressives who are extreme left wing, who really, I think, want to turn Maryland into, into a model socialist state. Um, so April and I and Justin and Haven have been fighting against that, and we're going to continue to do it with your support. Um, lastly, I just want to tell a story about April before I sit down. <laughs> okay, very, I'm sorry. Uh, real short story. So she, she came mid-session. She sat next to me in HGO. We were, her first day there, we were having a voting session. And the first bill to be called was a bill to provide for, for two lesbians who want to have a baby and would have to buy sperm. And the state of Maryland would pay for the cost of the sperm. And as this was explained, I could see she had this quizzical expression, like, what is this? What is this? And I turned to her and said, this isn't leave it to beaver country, is it? And she said, it certainly is not. <laughs> so anyway, we've been good friends ever since. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, I had hoped we would have some time for questions, but we are, we are out. But I do want to take this opportunity to say thank you to our committee this year. We had a very interesting year. It was very active, and uh, we can't do it without you. So we appreciate your input and your expertise. And if there is anyone that you know of or you who may be interested on in serving on the Legislative Committee, um, please let Mike or me know. And um, we hope to see everybody next year. And now I will turn it back to Mike. I'll take my tea. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Dana. Well, we fit a lot of stuff in here today. The good thing is, uh, if you have any questions, you can probably tackle them before they leave or get a cell phone and give them a phone call. I want to thank you all for coming. We've got students, we've got faculty, we've got business people, we've got CMC, we've got our delegation, uh, our legislative committee, people on the board. Thank you all so much. And for people at home watching, thank you for giving us your time to watch. Um, again, thanks to our sponsors, McDaniel, I think a special round of applause. This thing is great. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. I would like to request a special parking spot for myself out here for the next one so I can actually find the spot easily. I'm only kidding. NWSB Bank, thank you, and again to CMC.
Uh, we have a lot of events on our website, carrollcountychamber.org. You can go to it. We've got a calendar of all of our events. We have a ton of them coming up. There's a little flyer, so to speak, on everybody's table there um, that gives you a lot of the events coming up. We have a lot of grand openings. Keep in mind, if there's a grand opening, even though it's not your business, you're welcome to attend. They're always free, they're always fun, and it's really a way to support a local business. And it's local businesses that keep the economic engine running, that keep a lot of people, that uh, keep a lot of folks employed. I'm thinking specifically <clears throat> right now of a sad story of Coffee Music. Any of you who know that place, he's been on Main Street in Westminster for 38 years. Mr. Coffee's closing up shop. Must have spent more time with his, grand, with, uh, with his grandkids, and I applaud that. Uh, but I'm going to be mad at him for a long time because I like seeing that store on Main Street. But a store like that, like a lot of other stores, keep families going, keep people employed. So whenever you have a chance, spend your money locally. Uh, you're going to get a better product. You're going to get a better service. And as I like to say, uh, these folks are your neighbors, the ones that have stores around us. So other than that, I think um, that's all I want to say. I also want to thank Becky for all the work she did in helping to coordinate this event. Give her a round of applause over here. And I especially want to thank McDaniel for the amazing fireworks display you guys had a short time ago. You know, I look on Facebook and folks are like, my dogs are upset about the fireworks. And I'm like, come on, give me a break. It was beautiful. Off my deck, you can do it every Friday. Anybody calls to complain, just channel them through to me. I can handle them for you, okay? So anyways, thank you once again, everybody. Have a great, great day.